risen. Yeah. Hey, go ahead and have a seat. It is great to have you here on this Resurrection Sunday at Community Church. I want to welcome you. My name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the senior pastor. For those of you who might be here with us for the first time or you're still relatively new, it's great to have you here on, on this week and uh, joining with us as we celebrate our risen Savior. And um, as we come into this morning, you know, we can say, He is risen. And the response to that is, He is risen indeed. We can say that with confidence because of where we are this morning and looking back. But for the people in that morning, those women, the disciples, first thing as the sun was coming up, uh, what they saw was very different than what we're experiencing in the moment, at least at first. We've been in a series that we've called Your God is Too Small. And over these past number of weeks, we've been exploring who God is as He revealed Himself in His Word. And our purpose in doing so has been to try to peel back the layers that can accumulate over our time in terms of our expectations or our thoughts, the lenses that we can put on as we picture who God is in our minds, in our imaginations, and how we perceive Him. A.W. Tozer wrote this statement. He said uh, this. He said, there is a secret law of the soul that we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. That is, that those lenses with which we put on to perceive God, we move in that direction. We, we tend to act and respond in, uh, according to that picture. So if, if I see God as that demanding boss who's always checking my performance, I'll place a lot of time and energy and effort into trying to, uh, trying to fulfill the expectations that are constantly changing, that are never permanent, that I'm never quite sure I know where they are at, uh, and not really quite sure if it's really enough of all that I'm doing. If I see God perhaps as uh, that FedEx driver that's supposed to bring that next day delivery from Amazon, and I'm going to be watching for answers to the orders I place through prayer, and doggone it, I'm going to be upset if they don't come by 8 o'clock the following day. Or maybe I picture God and think of him as that, that docile old gentleman in the neighborhood who keeps his lawn nice and neat and doesn't really engage all that much, but he's surf friendly so that when I drive past and wave, you know, he waves back and he smiles, but, but that's about the extent of the involvement. You see, if we grab a hold of any one of those pictures or any other pictures that we might envision, and, and we put those lenses on and we perceive God in that way, we're we're not really seeing the God who is of the Scriptures. And, and it's been my prayer. I've been praying for us uh, and, and coming into this morning just praying that God would remove the lenses, peel back the layers, allow us to see God for who He's revealed Himself to be. I've been praying that prayer for myself, that that if there's been anything that I've put over my, my vision of my perception, my understanding of who God is, as, as much as possible, humanly possible, God, get rid of those. And I've been praying that prayer for us all together, you and for me, so that we might respond to God as he's revealed himself to be. And so as we come into this time of worshiping God through exploring his word, let's pray together, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise that because Jesus is risen, the tomb is empty, we can come boldly into your presence. And we, we do so now, asking, oh, Holy Spirit, that you would take uh, your word, that written word, and, and drive it down deep into our hearts so that we might know and experience the living word, the Jesus, the one who rose on that day. And so we give this time to you. Be honored and glorified in this act of worship, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Well, like I was saying, what they saw, what they perceived, what they understood happening so many years ago is very different from the point of view that we're looking at. You know, when they got up in that morning, what they saw in that day, um, they, they had an understanding of what was going on. I mean, when you woke up this morning, you probably had a general concept of what the day was going to hold, um, and, and so you just kind of started moving through the day in that way. Uh, we had one daughter, uh, Allison, our, our, my wife Susan and I have four daughters, and Allison, from, from the first, you know, from an itty-bitty little thing when she was young, she would say, uh, what are we doing today? What are we doing today? What are we doing today? And, and that would start to shape her sense of expectations of what was going to be accomplished and what was going to be done. Well, for the people back on that day, uh, they knew. Because when the world woke up that morning, uh, the events of the previous few days had established what was going to happen from their perspective, what they saw, what they understood. And in Luke 24, we read this in verse 1 where it says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. The women made their way to take care of Jesus' body. They knew what to expect. They knew how to grieve. As a matter of fact, their grieving had started days before when they saw uh, Jesus arrested and, and they saw him brutalized and they saw him tortured and they saw him mocked and they saw him pinned to the, to the cross and lifted up. They saw him die. And, and, and in beholding him die, the grief just knew no bounds. But yet, even on this day, they were still trying to make sense of their grief. They're still trying to understand it. What, what did all this mean? All the disciples were hiding, wondering, you know, what are they going to do next? The one that they had followed for three years was now gone, and so what are they supposed to accomplish? What, are, what direction are you supposed to go in? And for crying out loud, who's, who's to say that their fate wouldn't be the same as Jesus' fate? They didn't know. Oh, there were soldiers assigned to guard the tomb, and they stood ready to keep people from going into the tomb, to getting to the body of Jesus. They were going to stop anybody. And, and we can go through the entire cast of characters that we see in the gospel accounts that had a part in that day. And they all, they all just knew that it was time to make sense of things. They knew what was expected when someone died. You know, certainly the body of the person would remain unmoving, without breath. And you can appreciate the fact that after three days lying in a tomb, that body would have been cool to the touch and would in no way have represented the, the life that had been there. The women knew that would be the case. Everyone would come to the conclusion they had to adapt, and I don't know how they would say it back then, but they probably did say something like, well, you know, there come those times when it's time to move on. Now, that was easy for the people who had put Jesus up on the cross. Uh, they were breathing a sigh of relief. They were like, glad that Jesus situation is done and taken care of. Now we can move on to other things, those things we had to set aside because we were dealing with him. Now, now we can get back and focus on those. Uh, and certainly, those who had followed Jesus aching at the loss, and I know many of you have experienced loss, and you hear well-intentioned people say, well, isn't it time to move on? And, and you're kind of like, what does that even mean? How, how do I move on? What, what, does that, what, what is that like? What's that supposed to look like even? Well, these were some of the dynamics that were happening on that day. And, and Matthew records that as the women were making their way to the tomb, 
there was an earthquake. And you can imagine that the women looked at each other and said, oh, now what? After everything that else that's happened, now there's an earthquake? And, oh, what's that mean? And their concern probably only increased as they saw the guards either scattered on the ground, as Matthew records that, that when all this started happening, those, those guards fell like dead men upon the ground out of fear. And, or maybe, maybe they had just had enough time to recover that, that as the women were going to the tomb, they saw the guards booking it back towards Jerusalem to inform the powers that be about what had t- taken place in the morning. See, the guards, they were stationed there to keep people from going into the tomb. They were not stationed there, and they certainly weren't expecting anybody to come out of it. The women were trying to make sense of all this, and we read in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 2, these words, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. The tomb was empty. And what they saw that morning radically transformed their perception of of God and His work with that history-changing, life-altering question, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. if you read through the gospel accounts and you, and, you, and you read through all of them, you catch this note of fear. Uh, the gospel of Mark ends rather abruptly with the women standing there in fear trying to understand what's going on. And, and, and certainly the guards displayed fear, but the disciples had it. You just see this wave of fear going through. And, and one writer put it like this, as he reflected on this, uh, a writer by the name of Esau McCulley said, Easter is a frightening prospect. For the women, the only thing more terrifying than a world with Jesus dead was one in which he was alive. See, they were going to that tomb that morning to take care of a dead body, somebody that they had cared for but a dead body nonetheless. And so to see and to hear Jesus being alive was quite a shift in what they were expecting for the day. There was a lot they had to take in, and over those minutes, over those hours, processing with one another, processing with the, with the disciples, actually, several of them actually saw Jesus alive. They were just overwhelmed. But that fear turned to something else. The lives were transformed that day. The way they saw life change, the way they understood God, who they were, and God's work in them changed. The empty tomb meant that the promises of God were not empty. The empty tomb meant that the promises of God were fulfilled fully and freely on behalf of his people. That Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, God the Son, the Son of God, broke the power of sin and he defeated the power of death when he rose up on that day. And he invites people, as he invited people then, to follow after him. Lives were transformed then, and lives have been transformed every single day since then. You cannot look at the events of today, at the event of the resurrection, without being impacted. For for here's what we see. The resurrection challenges what we see and what we act on. You cannot look at the events and not be moved. We are challenged with what we see of God, 
who he's revealed himself to be, what we see of ourselves, and then what we understand to be God's work in and through us. Now, the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, he was writing a letter to a church in the city of Ephesus, and he was writing to a, a collection of followers of Jesus, a church. And he was striving to encourage them as they faced persecution because of their faith in Christ. Because they said, yes, I will follow Jesus. They experienced active persecution that included being forsaken by friends and family, uh, maybe losing their livelihood. There were any number of consequences that came about because they said, yes, we will follow Jesus. And so he was writing to encourage them in the midst of their daily struggles and that persecution. In the very first chapter of that letter called Ephesians, he goes on in those first uh, 14 verses to outline what God had done on behalf of, of his people. That God the Father had 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 put together a plan by which his people would be saved, that God the Son, Jesus, executed the plan in his own execution, and that God the Holy Spirit takes that plan and makes it real, applies it to the lives of God's people. And so Paul, in that first chapter, he's saying, no matter what you face, God has you securely in the palm of his hand, and he will not let you go. Well, then he goes on to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we read this. I'm going to start in verse 4 and read through verse 10. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I'm going to encourage you, and I challenge you, please, Take time to read through these verses again, from verses 4 through 10, and, and let them marinate on your heart and on your soul, because they tell us a lot about how we, we're to see God, how we're to perceive God, what He's revealed about Himself. If you were to take a pen or a pencil and start circling these words and drawing lines, you'd see there's one connection after another. For example, he says, He is rich in mercy. That, that word rich there, it means he's overflowing. It's super abundant. It's nonstop. He's rich in his mercy. And mercy being that which we deserve, but we don't get. We deserve wrath, God's wrath for our sin, but we don't get it. it because of his abundant mercy, the riches of his mercy, the immeasurable riches Again, that surpassing, just going and going, going, immeasurable riches of His grace. Something we don't deserve, but God gives. It's, it's nonstop. It's ongoing. It's all the time. Uh, it talks about His great love and His kindness. When you read through these verses... And you, and you let them sit there in your heart, and you start saying, okay, what, what's my picture of God? See, if, do, do you see a picture of God where he's that demanding boss that you can never satisfy? 
Do you see that picture of God who's just kind of, you know, cosmic gift giver, and that's all he's good for? Do you see God as, as that one of the docile old guy who just waves and a friendly smile as you drive by him? No! You read these descriptions of who God has revealed himself to be, who Paul looks and he, and he says, when you look at what they did to Christ and on the cross and what, what the empty tomb means, it's overwhelming what God has shown and demonstrated about himself for us, for his people. And, and that's got to impact the way we see God who he is. Uh, And it should also impact the way we see ourselves. For Paul describes us as being spiritually dead. That is, unresponsive to spiritual matters. Uh, Paul says it right there in verse 1 of chapter 2, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, That is, that we were unresponsive to spiritual matters that mattered to God. Because we were, our, our hearts were stone cold to it. We, we couldn't respond. We, now, certainly, being created in the image of God, there's some ways in which we reflect God. You, you know, you look like at a beautiful piece of art. Or you read a poem that's, you know, that, or you hear a song. That, that, that creativity comes because we are fashioned in the image of God. We reflect that characteristic of God to be creative in that way. But that's been broken. It's been also, it's been shattered by, by sin such that even my, my best efforts just, they don't have any consequence. That's why he says there's no works. No works are going to do it. Nothing I can do is going to have a lasting, eternal consequence. Now, there are plenty of things I can do in the course of my day. I mean, obviously, I got dressed this morning. You know, I had breakfast this morning. I I mean, I can do those things, but things of eternal consequence, I I just, I can't do in and of myself. Uh, There's no boasting. Paul says, yeah, you, you won't be able to boast, and if you think about it, God, the one who created the universe and sustains it by the word of his power, who are we to think? Who would I be to think that I can go before God and say, hey, God, (laughs) look at what I did. That's an absolutely dumb picture because I recognize in myself what Paul talks about, that the sin, the trespasses, that left to myself, all by myself. It wouldn't do, I mean, we all recognize that. Oh, we'll say, hey, you know, I'm a good person, but I'm not that bad. You know, I'm not that bad. So when I say I'm not that bad, I'm also saying I'm not that good either. But here... What Paul was reflecting on as he looked back at the cross and what Christ accomplished on the cross, and then at that empty tomb, he reflects on God's work within us, and he says, we are recreated in the image of Jesus. We're made to look like Jesus because God made us alive in Christ. God the one who takes the dead and brings them to life, makes people alive in Christ because Christ is alive. And that is the hope that we have. God raised us with Christ. God seated us in Christ. That is, we have relationship with God. And because we have relationship with God through faith in Christ, the works that we do are the works that God has purposed for us to do that have a spiritual consequence. They have a spiritual impact. So if you are here today and you've said, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus, the promise is that God has brought you to life in Jesus. He's at work fashioning you to look more like Jesus. 
And, and he's working such a way that the work that you do has that spiritual impact, has that eternal impact that results in changed lives. The tomb is empty. You've got to deal with it if you haven't dealt with it yet. As our worship team comes up to lead us in, in a song of response, so you see, the, there's an invitation here to see and believe. The call is to trust and to follow. You know, if, if indeed we, we, we put stock in that secret law of the soul that, that causes us to, to respond to our vision, our image of God, I would say look at Jesus and look at what he has done. And look at what he has accomplished for you. Look to Jesus and see what he has done on your behalf and what he is doing today. If you have said, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus, know that the promises of God have been fulfilled. That that it's, that it's, you know, you can anchor yourself in being made alive in Christ and raised with Christ, walking with him as a source of encouragement and strength when the challenges come, and they will come. But I want to speak to those of you who may be still putting the pieces of who Jesus is together. You see the the pieces like a jigsaw puzzle, and some parts make sense and other parts don't. I, I, I say... Explore Jesus carefully. Read about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Talk to other people about him and say, hey, tell me about who Jesus is. I want to know more about Jesus. After the service, I'll be up front. Please come and talk to me. I'd be glad to talk with you. Uh, Maybe you want to talk to the person you came with. You, You got up and somebody said, hey, guess what? It's Easter. You promised you'd come to church with me. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. And you're here, and all of a sudden, you're feeling some tugs in your heart. Well, I would assert that that is God starting to pull together those pieces that seem so random in front of you and saying, this is who Jesus looks like. He died on the cross for you. He bore the brunt of the punishment for you. And he rose so that you might live. God is tugging on your heart today. What better day there is than to say, yes, I will follow Jesus and to declare your trust in him. See, the the call is to trust and to follow. And we can do that because the empty tomb means that God's promises are not empty. They are fulfilled. So today is the day to say, yes, I will follow Jesus. It doesn't take some highly articulate prayer. You don't have to go to Bible college or school or anything. It's just a matter of saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. You died for me. My sins are forgiven because of what you've done. I want to live for you. I want to follow you. Today is a day to pray a prayer like that in response to his overwhelming, super abundant, ever flowing mercy in response to that love that knows no bounds, in response to that grace that God just keeps pouring out for those who call out to him. This, let this be the day. Let's stand together and let's pray. Oh, Father, we are thankful as we 
read this account of so many years ago. Those women coming to the tomb, finding it empty, hearing that question, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then that declaration, he is not here. He is risen. Oh, Lord, for those of us who've said, yes, we are here to celebrate, and yes, indeed, celebrate that our Savior lives. And we pray that in those times when we forget, you would bring us back to the empty tomb and say, look, Jesus isn't here. He's alive. And he's there for you. And Father, today I pray for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl. That you're tugging on their heart even now. Oh, grant them the faith and the courage to say, yes, I will follow. I will follow Jesus, risen from the dead, one day to return. I give my life to him. Oh, Lord, do that work in our midst. Do do that work right now in someone's heart. Oh, Lord, be glorified by the prayers of our heart. Be glorified by the song that comes from our lips. Be glorified, oh God, by our response, by our reactions to the grace and mercy you've displayed, you've shown, you've poured out to us through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And everyone said...